are on Lesson 7 of Revelation Part 3. As we go through this part of Revelation, we're trying to answer the question, or the subtitle of this part is, what is the sign of his coming and of the end of the age? Where did that question get asked? Do you remember? Matthew chapter 24. Very good. In first part, like first verse, verse 3, I think. Second like like 2 or 3. I'm sorry, first what? I was going to say first verse, never mind. It's one of those first <laughs> verses, yes. Okay. Um, we have spent quite a bit of time in part two, and even at the beginning of part three, setting where everything was in Revelation. I have been for two weeks writing up on the board, and I didn't get it written up today. Um, um, that's where I am. Um, so we're going to use it as a review. Okay, thinking through Revelation, there's some major events that are lined out in certain ways, and you can help me write this up there, and that'll be part of our review. So in Revelation, after we get through the description of Jesus in one, and we get through this chapters two and three, which contain what? The messages to the churches, the letters to the churches, and how many churches were there? Seven. And those were seven literal churches of that time, and John was told to write to them, John being the one who wrote down Revelation. It was revealed to him. Um, then, starting in chapter 4, there's a switch or transition in the book, right? Because the book is laid out in three parts, at least in one way, in three parts. John was told to write, therefore, the things, the things which are... No, I'm sorry, you were right. The things which he had seen. I'm just testing you. <laughs> so, you were right. The things which he had seen, the things which are, and then the things which take place after these things. Okay, so we've already said chapter 1 is the description of Jesus mainly, and that is the things which he had seen. And 2 and 3 are the messages of the churches, and that's the things which are. So it's starting where? It's the last part. 4 through 22. The end of the book is that last part, that last segment, which is the things which shall take place after these things, which is after the things which are and the things which he had seen. So, and, and things still future to us. So, as that happens in chapter 4, we unfold with the revelation to John. But we, he sees the throne of God, he sees heaven, he sees people and personages in heaven, but he sees a major character besides God on the throne. Who else does he see? In chapters 4 and 5. Jesus, what is he called? The one that's worthy? The, the lamb. lamb. Thank you. That's worthy to take the book and to do what? Break the seals, okay? So there's a scroll, literally, we call the book in our translation, but it has seven seals. And then he proceeds to do what? Break those seals, right? So there's how many seals in what chapter? Broken. Six seals in chapter six. Very good. Okay, so, but how many total seals? We've already said it. Seven seals. Okay, so if we have a timeline up here, oh, I don't mean to go that high. Because we need to put some things above it. We'll go down a little bit. Here. So <coughs> we have the seven seals. Okay. So we have seven seals. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then out of the seventh seal, what do we have? Seven seals. Okay, so we have seven trumpets. You don't happen to have a light up there, do you? Up here? No, don't have an overhead, sorry. Um, seven trumpets, and out of the seventh trumpet, what do we have? Seven bowls. Okay. Seven bowls. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, those are the three major things. But remember, as who is breaking the seals? Let's be reminded of that. Jesus, the Lamb, is breaking the seals. So out of the seventh seal come the seven trumpets. 
Meaning, if you collapsed all seven trumpets down, they are the seventh seal. If you collapse out of the seventh trumpet, come the seven bowls. So if you collapse the seven bowls down, they fit in the seventh trumpet. If you collapse all the trumpets down, they fit into the seventh seal. So who is bringing about all the action in Revelation? Jesus. Jesus. Right. That's extremely important. Okay. Now, on between the sixth and seventh seal, or right at the end of the sixth and the beginning of the seventh trumpet, there is what? 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 There's a big shift, a big transition in times, right? Because there are some time phrases. What are some of the time phrases that you find connected with the this the end of the sixth? But really, let's just say the seventh seal, trumpet being blown. What? Forty-two months of what? Which direction and what's going on? Okay, both directions, right? There's some things going this way and there's some things going that way, right? Uh, and it revolves around some time phrases. 42 months, three and a half years is what it's called, and that is called time, times, and half a time. And what's the other time phrase? 1260 days. Okay, those are all the same amounts of time. So we could say 1260 days equals 42 months, and that equals the time times and half a time. <coughs> but all of that is the same as three and a half years. Okay? So we are just going to, for the sake of writing things down quickly, uh, it is important to understand what God, how God says it. He says it in those different ways for different reasons. But we're just going to easily refer to it as three and a half years. Okay, so going backwards from this is three and a half years. Going forward from this and to the end of, of the seventh bowl is another three and a half years, right? Okay. The reason we don't know how far back that goes is we, I mean, we're not saying it like starts with the first seal because we don't know that. Revelation doesn't show us that. But we do know it's three and a half years, right? Mm -hmm. That falls somewhere in those. Okay? Might cover them all and it might not. But what happens in that first three and a half years that ends with this seventh trumpet? Two witnesses. The two witnesses, right. Their testimony goes... So we have the two witnesses, and it says their testimony lasts for 42 months, right? That's the three and a half year time frame. How do we know it ends right there at the trumpet? Because what, what ends their ministry? They're killed by the beast that comes out of the abyss. Where do we see that? Where do we see the two witnesses? Chapter 11. Very good. So if we were to find the two witnesses in Revelation, we find them in chapter 11, and we see there that they're killed. So you could write all that. They're killed, they're three and a half days in the street, and then they ascend to heaven. That's, but that ends, when that ends, there's a great earthquake, and the sixth trumpet ends, and the seventh trumpet begins. Right? So it's right at that pivotal point. Okay? But we know the beast is on the scene over here. Right? We know the beast is on the scene, okay, at least in Revelation. Now, we also know from chapter 12 that there is an event that happens that because that event happens and afterwards there is the next three and a half years. What event happens in chapter 12? You have the two signs, the woman and the great red dragon, but what is the event that happens that... That's war in heaven. There's a war in heaven between who? Satan, Satan, Satan and his Michael. angels and Michael and his angels, right? What happens as a result of that war? Satan's Satan is cast down. down. Okay, so here you've got the war in heaven that results in Satan cast down. Where is he cast down? To earth. Okay, so he's cast down there to earth. And as a result of him being cast down to earth, what does he do? Who does he go after? The woman, which was the other sign, and we, were, we have gone through our study, and we know the woman of chapter 12 that is the sign, and as she's described, is what? Israel. Israel. Right, so when Satan is cast down, first thing he does is he goes off to persecute the woman, right? So what does the woman do? Flees. She flees. She flees to the wilderness for how long? Three and a half years. 
So you've got the woman flees. There's two different time phrases, 1260 days and time times and half a time. That's that three and a half years, right? Like we've said down here. So the woman flees to the wilderness where a place has been prepared for, to, for her by God to protect her, right? And then as Satan comes down and he persecutes the woman, he goes after her, he knows he only has a short, short time. time. That's that time he knows he has, only a short time. So he's going to make the best use of his time in evil terms, best use of his time, but he's going to go and persecute the woman. And when the earth literally protects her, God has placed her in protection, what does he do? He turns and goes after who? Her son. The rest of her offspring. Right, the rest of her offspring who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Okay? Kay mentioned last week that this woman fling in the wilderness and where Satan comes down, when we've looked at it in other places as well, seems to be centered specifically on Jerusalem and the Jews that would have been in Judea, because it says, let those in Judea. Remember, where do we see that? Let those in Judea flee. Where do we find that? That's outside of Revelation. In Matthew, right? Matthew 24. Um, and so specifically to specific to Jerusalem, so the rest of her offspring could be in other parts of the world, right? Jews in other places. The rest of her offspring that hold to the testimony of Jesus. Um, that's a possible idea from what that might mean. He went off after the rest of her offspring. Okay, then we transition from 12 to 13 chapters, that is, remembering that the chapter divisions are man-made. And you see he, Satan, standing on the shore of the seashore, and he sees what coming out of the ocean? The beast. The beast, or coming out of the sea, is the beast. And as a result of being cast down, going after the woman, and being enraged, and he's only got a short time in chapter 13, what does he do? He gives his, the beast, his power, his authority, and his throne, right? How long is the beast's authority? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. So during the same time the woman, woman flees, you've got the beast with authority given by Satan, and he's got authority for 42 months. And what does he do during those 42 months? Who does he war against? The saints. The saints. Right. And he overcomes some, it seems, or it seems like he's going to overcome them and all. But he has beast with authority for 42 months. It's during that period of time. And we know as we transition on, we've got chapters 14 through 22. But we have several things happening during that time. But what is the event that ends the beast's authority? Yes, Jesus is coming. Where do we find that? Chapter? You don't know. Okay. 19. Very good. I, I'm just asking because if you have to kind of go by memory, it'll help. All right? So what happens here is the Son of Man, and he comes with the clouds at this point, which is where the beast's authority and the woman's Fleeing, that time frame ends because when Jesus comes in chapter 19, there are some events that happened before that. Babylon has fallen. They're rejoicing. Babylon has kind of been described. There has been a gathering. Remember the three demons that went out like frogs and they gathered the armies. Um, where were they gathering them to? Armies of the earth. Armageddon is what it says. We call it Armageddon. They were gathered. That's not happened yet, but they were gathered, at least at this point. But when Jesus comes, there's what comes against him. What comes with him? Let's tell you that. The army comes with him on white horses also. So Jesus comes with his army, and there's an army that comes against him, right? And that's that army that has been gathered at Armageddon, or we call it Armageddon. So what happens here, we a lot of times call it the Battle of Armageddon. Because of that gathering at Armageddon, it happens at this point. Okay. What else happens at that point? I'm sorry? The army's killed. The army's killed by what? God. Yes, the sword that comes proceeds out of Jesus' mouth. In other places in Scripture, we know that's his breath. But the sword that comes out of his mouth uh, kills the armies. And what happens as a result of the armies and the horses being killed? The blood comes up to the horse's bridle. That's a different part of Revelation, but right. The blood comes up to the horse's bridle um, for how many miles? 
200 miles. That's all, that's called that's in chapter I think 14 or 15, and it's when all those angels different have different messages. And the last messages is talk, is talking about the sickle going into the earth and gathering the vine and throwing them where into the wine press of the wrath of God. Where the horses, where the blood, sorry, comes up to the horse's bridle for 200 miles. So this battle of Armageddon could also be called the great wine press of God. Right? Okay? So that's going to happen here. And, and chapter 19, take your mind back there, the birds are told to gather for what? The great supper, the great of, God. supper of God. Because what happens after the, bat the army is killed? They eat the flesh of the animals, I mean, the, the horses and the people. So the Great Supper of God happens here. Or even prior to, when they're rejoicing over the fall of Babylon, and prior to the description of Jesus coming, it talks about the, the, marriage, supper, the marriage of the Lamb has come and the marriage supper, those who are invited or blessed. So all of that's talked about in chapter 19. Now, after the, as a result of the Battle of Armageddon, and why we brought it up, is whose end comes? Beast. Not right. Satan's yet. Beast. Beast. The beast and the false prophet. So the beast and, and I'm going to say FP for false prophet, what happens to them? I always put the lake of fire over here for some reason. Um, it's just kind of, I'm just putting a destination. So these two are thrown into the lake of fire. As a result, alive, they're thrown alive into the lake of fire. The armies are killed, and the birds beat off their flesh. Now, after chapter 19, going into chapter 20, what do we have entering in? A thousand years. A thousand years, okay. There's a thousand year period of time. And what goes on in that thousand years? Satan's bound. Satan is bound for a thousand years. So he's bound. And what is the point of binding him? So that he will not do what? He won't deceive the nations any longer until the end of that thousand years. What else happens in that thousand years? Jesus. Yes, Christ reigns. And who reigns with him? Saints. Right. The saints reign with him. There are thrones set up. Okay? So all of this is in Revelation. That's in Revelation 20. At the end of the binding, bound of thousand years of Satan, he is what? Released. Released. And what does he do? He goes and deceives the nations. He goes all over the place. It's hard to imagine, but he's given that opportunity. He does it again. And what happens as a result? He ends up in the lake of fire. But right before that, what has he done? He's gathered them at a... Right outside the, it says the city, city which we, is Jerusalem, and it only makes sense that it would be Jerusalem, and the camp of the saints. And so that army comes and gathers, and what happens to that army? They're thrown in the lake of fire. They aren't, but how are they, what is their end? Who kills them? God. Fire comes down from heaven. Jesus, I guess. Yeah, fire comes down out of heaven and, and, and just zaps them. As they gather, and it says Gog and Magog, so a lot of times we call that the Battle of Gog and Magog, if you've ever heard that. That would happen here. And as a result, Satan is cast into the lake of fire. That is the place, the lake of fire, that was prepared for Satan and his angels. Did you notice it was the place prepared for Satan and his angels? He wasn't ever prepared, necessarily, for people, right? But what's the result? We've already got the beast and the false prophet thrown there. And we've got Satan thrown there. And after the thousand years, after what we're calling the battle of Gog and Magog, after Satan is thrown into the lake of fire, what's the next thing? The great white throne. Okay, so here you have... The great white throne. And he who sits on it. <coughs> and then it says book, a book is open, and books are opened. And who's brought before it? The dead. Death, 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 the dead. And Hades. Death. Just make sure we get it all. And Hades. Not leaving anybody out. What happens to all of them as a result of coming before the great white throne? 
for all cast into the lake of fire. Okay, and it's based primarily on one book. What book is that? The book of life and the fact that they're not written in it. Okay. Remember throughout Revelation, there's a group of people called, I call them the earth dwellers, but those who dwell on the earth. And in chapter 13, we're told those who dwell on the earth will believe in the beast, will worship the beast, will take, but they were also not written in the book of life. And within that thousand year reign, the sheep and the goats are separated. Not, well, not in Revelation, but yes, we'll get to that in a second as we add to, yes, thank you. Hold on to that thought. <laughs> the sheeps and the goats. Sheep, sheep, I always say that, sheep and goats. Okay, so we've got the, the dead, death, and Hades, and then we roll into chapters 21 and 22, and what do we have? A new heaven. New heaven, right? New, new, new heaven. <coughs> heaven. Oh, yeah. Heaven. Earth and Jerusalem. Earth and Jerusalem. And the new Jerusalem comes out of where to where? Heaven. It comes out of heaven down to earth, mm -hmm. and it is described as the bride. Mm -hmm. Keep that in mind, right? And, and explained and all, and in chapter 21 and 22, we have a description of all that. We don't want to dismiss that, but we're trying to put major events up here. And then we're going to roll into what we found in Matthew 24 and 25, starting with a little bit of a 23, and that's part of what Sandy was talking about. Um, we're going to try to put some of that up here real quickly. But in Matthew 24, after, okay, in 23, we see Jesus coming where? Where, where does he come out of? Temple. Comes out of the temple. But he also has already called out the Pharisees and Sadducees and all that and said of them that they're hypocrites. That's in 23. Yeah. And then he grieves over Jerusalem and says, I would that I could gather you like chicks. Remember that protectiveness? Mm -hmm. But then he says, when he walks out of the temple, he says what? You will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and I leave what to you? I leave this house to you desolate. That's the word, desolate. Mary. Yeah, okay. So when he walks out, then he walks outside, and the disciples point out what they're walking around in among, which is what? They just walked out of the temple. So you've got all those buildings. And they're pointing them out. They're kind of cool. Sorry. That's not what they say. That's a paraphrase. <laughs> but they walk along and they end up over in the Mount of Olives where they can look back from more east than, and they're looking back on the Temple Mount. And Jesus tells them what? Not one stone will be left upon another. He's talking about those. Yes, it's going to be destroyed. Right, so he's talking about the buildings and he's talking about what they're looking back on. And then they ask him some questions. They say, when will, this happen? When will all this happen? What is the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And that's either two questions or one. <coughs> <coughs> then we, he starts answering, but what does he really answer? What part of that does he answer in Matthew 24? It just says, do not be misled. Yes, a lot about a lot of warnings. Don't be misled. Be on alert. Watch out. Um, and I'm sorry, Sandy. Well, I said many will come in my name, saying that you're the Christ. Yes, and what? So that many will come, and so we can just say many false Christs will come because they're going to be saying they're the Christ. And what would be the goal of that, Sandy? What does it say? mislead, right? To mislead. So it's don't be misled and all that. So again, and I mentioned this when we studied it, but if he's telling, he's giving them these warnings, they need to heed it. Remember what time are we talking about here in the ministry of Jesus? Right before the crucifixion, that final week. Now everything he ever said was important, but you can imagine he knows what's coming. They don't get it completely, but he knows what's coming. They understand the atmosphere in the city. They're responding to that as well. They're not casual, but they think he's Superman, sorry. They think he's Iron Man, that nothing's going to happen to him, and only what God wants to will only happen to him, but they don't get it yet. But he does. So it's an extremely important small period of time that he has. So everything he says is extremely important and vital. This is that last few things that he can tell them. So as <coughs> he walks out and they're looking at the building, he tells them there's no stone going to be left on another, but he's telling them all these things not to be misled by. 
<coughs> and to be on alert about because and but he's telling them what the truth is going to be so that they can recognize the false right if he's saying there's going to be false Christ how are they going to know how are they going to know they're false Christ because they've known the real and we can get to know the real it's that counterfeit idea Satan always counterfeits we have a tendency to think that Satan does things exactly opposite of God if he did everything exactly the opposite of God, it is in its own way the opposite of God. But if he did everything on, on the visual level exactly the opposite of God, it'd be obvious, wouldn't it? And that's not what Satan's biggest tool is, right? What's Satan's greatest tool? Deception. Lies and deception, right? So it's that idea of counterfeiting, making it look so much like the real that it's hard to detect. Right? <coughs> so, that's part of what Jesus is saying is know the real, therefore you can detect and understand the counterfeit. So, he answers mainly that second question, right? In Matthew 24, okay? So, when he's in Matthew 24, he tells them some big events, big chunky events. <laughs> and first he tells them about the what comes before those big events, and what does he call the wars and rumors of war and nation against nation and people? Birth pains, just like my niece in law went through. Okay, so over here somewhere, we're not exactly sure what's all part of the birth pains, but there's birth pains. Because those birth pains lead up to something, just like what my niece went my niece in law went through, resulted in a delivery, right? But she went through a long period of time. She's pregnant first. And then she went into birth pangs. Okay? And then the result in her case was the birth of a child. So if these are birth pangs of events and things, what is the delivery in our Christ coming, right? The end. The end of the age. It's the end of that particular age. Right? So the end of the age, according to Matthew 24, is what event? Coming of Christ. Right? So we can call this the end. I'm just going to say the end, but it's the end of the age. Right? And that's one of the questions we're trying to answer, is the coming of Christ. It enters, there's something else that's entered into, so it's not the end of all things. It's the end of the age. And it comes with the coming of Christ. So, starts with birth pangs and comes down to the end. What is in the middle? What's, I mean, not in the middle. What's between? The tree, the tree the seal, what? trumpets, and bowls. Seal, okay, so we have got the seals, trumpets, and bowls. Where, did, where does Matthew 24 events, where do they fall? Can we name some of them, nail them down? One of them is abomination of desolation, right? And it says... Let the reader beware. Let those of Judea flee to the mountains. What does that sound like from Revelation? The 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 women fleeing, right? So if the woman's going to flee, and that's let those in Judea flee to the mountains, and that abomination of desolation, which we can't necessarily nail down just from Matthew 24, but we can from 2 Thessalonians, remember? 2 Thessalonians has the man of lawlessness revealed. But what does the man of lawlessness do? He sets himself up as God in the temple, and that's called what? That is related to the abomination of desolation. Okay, so if that happens here, because remember, it says he makes a covenant. If Daniel tells us that he, which is the prince who is to come, makes a covenant for a week, that last week of Daniel's prophecy, which is seven years, but in the middle he breaks it. And it says, on the wing of abominations. So you're having to pile all these kind of on top of each other to make sense. But you've got Daniel 9, verse 27, talking about on the wing of abominations, one will come who has an end. It talks about him having an ending in destruction. And that's, we believe, is the, from Daniel 9, it's the uh, prince who is to come. Prince of the people who is to come. He's mentioned previously to that in verse 25, I think. Or 26. But we also have the man of lawlessness mentioned in 2 Thessalonians, and it talks about him going into the temple and setting himself up as God. That event is right here, and it's that abomination of desolation. 
what happens according to Matthew 24 after the abomination or as a result of the abomination of desolation when it what period enters in tribulation. the great tribulation so during this time you've got the great tribulation and since I've got my things off here it's that period of time between the abomination of desolation and the end of the age, which is Christ's return. Because all of that's described in Matthew 24, isn't it? It talks about immediately following those days, the days of the Great Tribulation. You have the sun going black, the moon go losing its light, the stars falling, the powers of heaven shaken, and right then, they're going to see what? The sign of the coming of the Son of Man, right? Then they're going to have the Son of Man coming, with the clouds and with his angels in this case. His angels come. Then we also looked at the parables in Matthew and we saw mm -hmm. the um, wheat and tares parable mm -hmm. where the tares are gathered and thrown into the barn eventually. And the, did I say the tares? Okay. The tares are gathered, not thrown in the barn, they're thrown into the fire. Then the wheat is gathered and it's taken into the barn. Okay. So that is the picture of the entering into the wheat entering into this thousand year reign and the tares being gathered and thrown into the fire. Then we also have the pair we have going into Matthew 25, we have several different analogies. We've got the, the uh, wicked slave analogy, we've got the ten virgins analogy. Well, I won't say analogy, that'd be not a parable, would be a better word. And then we also have the, the well done slaves versus the slave that was wicked going into the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, which we know of as this lake of fire. Because it's also the eternal punishment, right? That's also talked about in, that, in Revelation 20. A lot of these things start adding up. Okay, so we have this abomination of desolation. Um, the, uh, in Daniel, he's called the one who comes on the wing of abominations. He's called the prince in Daniel 9. The man of lawlessness, lawlessness in Second Thessalonians. This is all the beast. Say person. Son of destruction. Son of. They're the sons of destruction. Yeah, the ones that are the tares. The, uh, I believe that was what they were called in that. Or maybe the sons of destruction come as a result. I'm trying to think of where that term is. Is that in? Is that in? Second Thessalonians. Son of destruction, beast. I don't know. Okay. Um, but he has his end, and this. So here's the beast here. All of these are the same as the beast. Same terminology. They have that, he has his time, not they. He has his time, but it will end. And it ends with him being cast into the lake of fire. It ends with the return of Jesus. That's the end of the age. His end comes. So as we're putting those together. Now as we look at Luke chapter 19... Remember, I told you last week, Kay mentioned this also, Matthew's goal in writing. Remember, God speaks through these men. These are God's words. We don't ever want to negate that. But God speaks in their voice, in a sense. He uses the personalities. He uses the environment. He uses all of that to give his message. So Matthew's point, or Matthew's goal, or the goal of the, of the book of Matthew, we should say that better, is to kind of prove Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is king, okay? So whenever you read Matthew, think of that. That is his goal in writing. So he focused on explaining when Jesus is coming again, and he's coming to reign. So remember, that's what Matthew's talking about and showing us in Matthew 24 and 25 when we looked at that. Luke, when he writes, he's a physician, his, he's... He's, his goal in writing is to lay things out for us chronologically. It's great that God used the different personalities different ways. So when you read Luke, if you read in Luke 19, and then you turn over a couple of pages and you're in Luke 21, what do you know has happened? Time has progressed, right. So whatever happens, if there's events, whatever happens that he's telling you about in Luke 19 happened before Luke 21. It's that simple. <laughs> and it's wonderful because you can go to the other what they call synop synoptic gospels which are uh, Mark and Matthew with Luke and if you're wondering when an event happened in one of those you can 
kind of figure it out through Luke. You should be able to figure it out through Luke as to when he says it happened. So Luke 19 is describing what event. The, the verses that you looked at this week, what event is chronologically happening in Luke 19? Right. Jesus sends the disciples to get the cult. So, yes, we call that the triumphal entry. We celebrate it each year as what? Palm Sunday. Right. So, what day of the week did this happen? Sunday. First day of the week. Very good. Sunday. Yeah. Not just because we say that, but that is when it happened. So, that is the beginning of what week? Holy. The Holy Passover. Week, sometimes we call it. Passover was where it was occurring in time for the Jews, right? That week, um, they would have been gathered into Jerusalem for the Passover that was coming up. And for us, we call it the Holy Week a lot of times. But it's the beginning of that last week before Christ's crucifixion and his burial and his resurrection. So this is one week prior to his resurrection. So keep in mind, okay? So Matthew, Luke 19 is telling us that. But within those verses, starting in verse 41 to 48, he describes something as he's there in the city and he weeps over it. Does that remind you of something in Matthew 24? 23, actually. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, right? Here he is weeping again. Similar, right? And But <clears throat> he says... As he approaches the city, he wept over it, and he says, If you had known the day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. He's weeping because I didn't get it. Mm -hmm. And then he says in verse 43, what? Days shall come upon you when what? Enemies will throw up a bank before you, surround you, hem you in on every side, level you to the ground and your children within you, you being the city, your children within you, and they will not leave you one stone upon another. Where did you hear that already? Matthew, Matthew 24, right? So, in their time, they don't know when that's going to happen, but we know when this happened. When did this happen in time? General Titus, 70 AD. So we'd be back here somewhere. 70 AD. 70 AD, very good. Um, which is after the crucifixion, if you want to put the crucifixion up there. This is uh, talked about in um, Matthew 24 briefly. Now it's talked about in Luke 19 also. And we know it was General Titus in 70 AD. And this did happen. But remember when he's telling him this, he's telling his specific group of people that he's talking to, which is primarily those disciples that are around him, Jews are the focus, and this is going to happen to what city? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Okay. So he tells them about it, and he says their enemies will come, and they'll do all of that. And then um, he, this, the next event in this chapter is when Jesus does what? He gets angry. Yes, he turns over the tables and cleanses the temple of those he calls the robbers, right? Those that are um, doing the false weights and measures. Then you go over to chapter 21. Okay, so we've got in mind that in 19 was the triumphal entry on Sunday. And then, and remember, Sunday was not their day of worship like it is ours. Saturday was their day of worship, right? Sunday was the first day of the week. So when all of that was happening, there were still people in the temple, but they were getting ready for Passover. So you had all these people coming, the, and they would have been bringing their animals from afar. They would have been buying animals for sacrificing and all of that. So you've got these money changers that were robbing a blind, either through false weights and measures or through bad exchange rates or just cheating them completely. And Jesus said, this is not what's supposed to be going on. And he turns the tables over and he's... Very righteously angry. Okay, so in chapter 21, you have what sounds like a very similar conversation that we found in Matthew 24, right? Okay, but let's be very discerning and see if it is exactly the same. Um, because in Matthew 24, we had established when, in 23, he's walking out of the temple for the last time. So that would have been the last time. Here, you've got... A statement that's made at the very end that gives you a clue that this may or may not be the same conversation 
as Matthew 24. Mm -hmm. Want to look at the last verse? It says, and all the people would get up early in the morning and come to him in the temple to listen to him. So, well, let me back up to verse 37. Now during the day he was teaching in the temple, but at the evening he would go out and spend the night on the mount that is called Olivet. And all the people would get up early in the morning to come to him to the temple to listen to him. So this sounds not like that last time, but it's during the week between Sunday and Thursday, right? So is this the exact same conversation as Matthew 24? No. There's other clues. Okay, But it's similar statements, but it's not exact. So this just means that Luke is accounting something. <coughs> Jesus talked about this stuff more than once. That's one of the things you can know about this. Okay, so Jesus, it says, and he... Uh, he sees the widow, the poor widow, putting more in. We kind of know that. Um, in verse 5, it says, Some were talking about the temple, but it was adorned with beautiful stone votive gifts. And he said, As for these things which you're looking at, the days will come in which not one stone left upon another, which will not be torn down. We've heard that, right? We heard that in Matthew 24, right? So what is he referring to? We've already established in Matthew 24. What he's referring to when no stone will be left upon another is what? Yes. Titus coming into the city in 70 AD. Okay? So he's talking about this more than once. And then he says, um, they said, teacher, listen to the questions. Where, when, therefore, will these things be? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? Are those the same questions as Matthew 24? Yes. No. No? <laughs> Talking about Titus. Okay, let me read them again. Yes, we just mentioned no stone left upon another. We know in history, for us, future to them, that's 70 AD. But just so keeping that in mind, listen to the questions. They say, when will these things be? That's the same question as Matthew 24's first question. Sounds like it at least, very similar. Then the second question is, what will be the sign when those things are about to take place? It's what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the day. Exactly. In Matthew 24, the second question is different from this question. Mm -hmm. What question did he answer in Matthew 24? That second question. Barely touched the first one. He would mentioned these stones and all, not left upon another. But here, they're only asking him seemingly about that. When will those things happen? Okay. And he says, see to it that you're not misled. Very similar to what he said in 24, Matthew 24. See that you're not misled. Many will come in my name saying, I am he. And then you will hear of wars and disturbances. Don't be terrified, said. Very similar. For these things must take place first, but the end does not follow immediately. Okay, so again, what have we established is the end? Christ's return. Okay, so if Jesus is talking about the end, he's talking about his return, his return to earth, right, the second coming. And it says, but the end does not follow immediately. Um, so he's not talking about the events that take place right here. Okay, he did kind of the same thing in Matthew 24 also. And then he said, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there'll be great earthquakes in various places plagues and famines there'll be terrors and great signs from heaven but before all these things right before all those things he just mentioned they will lay hands on you persecute you deliver you to synagogues and prisons bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake okay when does that happen at least before the stuff that happens right before the end. Okay? So it's over here somewhere. Anywhere between his crucifixion and before, I'm going to say, before probably the abomination of desolation. Okay? And he's talking to a very specific group of people standing right there talking to him Jews. that have asked him these questions. Jews and Jews. specifically his disciples. So he could be describing things that happen all the way back here. Because what happens, what we know happens to his disciples and his followers. Yes, most of them were martyred except for the one that's right in the book of John and the book of Revelation, namely John. 
Um, he had his own troubles. But prior to 70 AD, they were not necessarily persecuted very much. But after 70 AD, what happened? What happened as a result? That We call that the diaspora, where they were scattered and, yes, dispersed to go to all the world and preach the gospel that they were supposed to be doing instead of holed up in Jerusalem. God dispersed them. Remember that. If you won't go do what God has told you to do, sometimes he'll send you. And it might not be a very fun sending. Um, but he's, they, they're sent into the world. It's not a good thing. Jerusalem is destroyed. So these specific things he's talking about here could be talking about that time, certainly. But it could also be talking about a lot of times that have happened between. Okay? But if you're talking about the Jews in particular, this is a great description of what happened to them especially as a result of the destruction of the city in 70 AD. Okay? So if you're going to put that somewhere, that's one of the things you could put. But it's it mainly, in a very general sense, it's not, it's going to happen before the events that happen right before the end. So we might put it under birth pangs. Mm -hmm. Okay? That he talked about in Matthew 24. That's the turn from Matthew 24. They're going to lay hands on you, persecute you, deliver you to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. And we can start naming that have all that happened to Paul, certainly, right? Okay, and so it happened around and after 70 AD. But it, what would it lead to? Opportunity. Uh, opportunity for their testimony. Think about the disciples. Think about Stephen standing there, the first martyr. Thinking about Paul as he was told when he had been blinded and was receiving sight again, you're going to, or actually I think the guy that was going to Paul was told, he's going to be before kings. Mm -hmm. Or maybe Paul was told, I have to go back to Acts and read that. But Paul was going to be taken before kings. He was going to tell the gospel to all kinds of people. What we would see as a bad situation when he was imprisoned and, and taken before courts, he got to give the gospel of Jesus to some of the biggest rulers of the times and the places he was. It was an opportunity for their testimony. So it says, make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves, for I will give you utterance and wisdom, which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. Now who's the I will in that? God. Jesus is saying, I will. Yes, God will give you that utterance and wisdom. So it's saying, don't, don't worry about it in advance. Doesn't mean you don't think about it. Doesn't mean you don't prepare what the gospel might be. Doesn't mean you don't study. It means that in the moment, you will have that wisdom and utterance given to you, that courage and that strength. Now, this is specific to a group of people. Can we take this to heart as well? Yeah. Times are coming when our testimony is going to be difficult. There's going to, our lives are going to be difficult because of what we stand for. We see it right now in the political realm, oh, yes. how many are being ridiculed if they speak the truth mm -hmm. from Scripture in our country. A Muslim man can refuse to deliver beer as a delivery truck driver, and that's okay, but a woman who's a clerk in Kentucky can't mm -hmm. refuse to give same-sex marriage license or she's going to be put in prison. That's where we are in America today in 2015. No more freedom of religion. Oh, there is unless, if you're Muslim. Unless you're Muslim. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was thinking the other. I was thinking last night if the kids dress up as the birthdays and everything. I wonder if somebody's going to complain about that. And right. Take away Halloween from all the kids. Oh, well, that'd be interesting. Yeah. Would take away Halloween if they. The boys with <laughs> and yeah. Things, you know. Mm -hmm. Would Muslims Make celebrate Halloween? I can't imagine. <laughs> um, yeah. And it says, you'll be hated on account of my name. So if they're going to be hated on account of his name, what does that say about them? They're Christians. They're, Christians. they're believers in Jesus, right? That just Again, sometimes the most uh, little thing. It says, not a hair on your head will perish, but by endurance you will gain your lives. Mm -hmm. Okay. And again, thinking if we're going to be really specific to this group of people, did they come out of all of this unscathed no. in our view of things? No. no. Did they come out unscathed? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. In the yeah. eternal view of things. You know, it says not one hair on your head will perish, but their bodies would. They were going to be martyred. They were going to be killed. 
And in Revelation, it talks about that too. You know, the saints are going to be warred against, and it looks like the beast is going to over, overcome them. But we know we are overcomers, right? Not necessarily living through it, but we're going to have what? Eternal life. So this life, by their endurance, what does that phrase remind you of from Matthew? The one who endures to the end will be saved, right? So it's the same type of phrase. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. Eternal life is really what it's talking about here. Okay, The only one that matters. Then in verse 20 it says, When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is at hand. This is talking about what event? The 70 AD destruction of Jerusalem. Okay, How is this same or different from what is told in Matthew 24? When it says the abomination of desolation. When it says, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, let the reader beware. It's before the church of Jerusalem. For one thing, there is a temple here, and that is true because when Jesus came and went in the temple, but it also tells us here there's a temple because the man of lawlessness has to go inside that temple. But this one was destroyed, so we know there's another temple. So that's one of the things we can know during this time, up to at least this abomination of desolation. There's a temple. But there was a temple back there, and it was destroyed. So somewhere between here and here, there's going to be another temple. And we are somewhere after this, and there is no temple now. Yes, Cindy? No, I just want, there's, and God never returned to that temple. Did right. Yeah. Right. This, except for Jesus. Right. Yeah. In this time, when Jesus was brought in as an eight-day-old baby, mm -hmm. God returned to the temple. I just can't not smile when I say that. <laughs> I just think that's awesome. But back here, there will be a temple. And it's awesome. Okay, so, oh, going back, when it's talking in verse 20, it says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by the armies. Is that what is said in Matthew 24? No. No. It says, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. Now, where's the holy place? In it's in the temple. Where's the temple? Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. Right. So it is talking about the same city, but this is talking about a different thing. When you see the army surrounding the city, um, it says, recognize that her desolation is at hand, and then it describes it. And it says again, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Get out of the city is another way of putting it. And um, it's awful. You know, let woe to the ch one who's with child. Very similar statements that are being said of the time that's coming that we know is here in time, not there in time. Remember, a lot of times God will do things at different times to kind of give them a picture of what's going to happen before. We've talked about prior to Jesus, back in, I put it up there last week, 600, I think, B.C. No, it wouldn't be that far back. 400 and something, I think, B.C. We've got the destruction of the temple by Antiochus Epiphanes. Not destruction defiling of the temple, desolation of the temple, the first abomination of desolation 165. after... 165. I'm sorry? 165. 165. Okay, thank you. Not 400, not 600. I knew there was a 600 somewhere. Okay, 165 B.C. I had it over here last time. 165 B.C. You've got Antiochus Epiphanes. And that was the other abomination of desolation. Okay, But when this happens in 70 AD and you hear this description, yes, it's a desolation, but it's not abomination of desolation. He, there's no mention of someone going into the temple when this happens. And in setting up, like Antiochus Epiphanes, slaughtered a pig, defiled the temple, and they cleansed the temple as a result. And that's what we know them to celebrate as Hanukkah, or the Festival of Lights, as a result of that, to cleanse the temple. That's, way, that's back before Jesus. So when Jesus is talking in Matthew 24 about an abomination of desolation that's coming, he's not talking about that one, he's talking about another one that's coming. But that gives us a picture of and an idea of what this one might be like. But remember, usually the next one is worse. Right. So even this destruction is bad that he's describing here in Luke, 
in this, yeah, Luke 19, in Luke 19 and now we see it in Luke 21. It's bad. This one's worse. I mean, that one's bad. This one's going to be worse. Sorry. Um, the direction later, the stuff that's coming, describes it. And then he goes on and he says, he mentions in verse 24, they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all nations and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until what? The times of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Okay? So Jerusalem is going to be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Okay? Next week's lesson is about that, the times of the Gentiles. If you don't understand exactly when that is, you will find out next week for sure. But what do, can we know about it from this? The most literal. There is going to be a time of the Gentiles. <laughs> and I'm sorry, and there's going to be a trampling under the feet of the city, right? We've heard the trampling at the temple court under the feet of the Gentiles. Where did we hear that? In Revelation chapter there you go. It's right before the two witnesses, right? Or mentioned. Okay, so Revelation chapter 11. How long is the temple going, the court of the temple going to be trampled underfoot according to Revelation 11? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. I think it's 42 months, I think is the time phrase, but three and a half years. Or maybe 12 years. It's just easier to say three and a half years. It's easier to say three and a half years. <laughs> Uh, there's a reason God gives us those yeah. specifics, and I don't always know why, but it's easier to say three and a half years. Okay, so then it says, uh, so there's a time of the Gentiles, and that Jerusalem is going to be trampled underfoot until that time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Okay, so there's going to be that time. We don't know when it starts necessarily and when it ends yet. Hopefully next week we'll be able to establish that. But we do know it's, it's going to happen. Okay, so just for a second, when I say time of the Gentiles, who are the Gentiles? Us. Us. Anybody that's not Jewish. Anybody that's not Jewish. That's the easiest way to remember. It's Jews and Gentiles. Jews and everybody else. Okay? So that could include us, Muslims, actually. It can include any people group that are not Jews. We have a tendency when we think of Gentiles as us because we have been brought in you know, as those who are far off and brought near, thank God, by Christ, and we've been brought into a reconciled relationship with God, but also a reconciled relationship with Jews, and so we are Jew and Gentile in one body. Doesn't mean all Gentiles, but it means Gentiles were brought in, and grafted in is another way Paul puts it. Okay, so, but when it's talking about Gentiles, it's talking about anybody that's not Jew. Always remember that. Okay, so then in verse 25, what does it talk about? Signs. 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 Where? Stars. Sun, moon, and stars, and upon the earth, <coughs> dismay among nations, seas and the waves. Okay, what does this remind you of? What have you heard before in the book of Revelation? Right, especially back here in the seals and the beginnings of the trumpets and all, you've got the earth. You have the sun. You have all of these created things being impacted. What were you going to say? The full moon last night. Can you imagine seeing that when it's all red? Oh no! Well, well the blue moon. Like, if we could well, have seen no, it. Well, no, I'm in like and <laughs> yeah. In this time, if there was a full moon. Yes. Oh, or red. And red, or then black. Yeah, because there's going to be those signs in the heavens. Okay. Now, as we're looking at this, right after it's talking about the signs. It says, men fainting from fear and expectation of things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. What comes right after that? Right. So then he describes the powers of heaven shaken. And then you've got the coming of the Son of Man. So now we're back to some events that are similar to, closely tied to Matthew 24. And it says, The Son of Man is coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now it says, then in verse 28, When these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your head, because your redemption is drawing near. King James says, your redemption is nigh. You've probably heard that before, your redemption is nigh. Redemption is drawing near. Um, 
But you notice in Luke 21, the focus is not on the coming of the Son of Man. Not as much. It's mentioned, but it's not where the focus is. Matthew 24 is focused more on the events prior to, leading up to, and then the event of the coming of the Son of Man. And as we rolled into Matthew 25, which I almost forgot, Sandy, to come back to it, um, in Matthew 25, after we go through those parables, the next thing he talks about is the throne set up, Jesus on his throne, and what's brought before him. What, what does he divide? The sheep and the goats. The sheep and the goats that he divides in Matthew 25 come from where? Because it says, what is brought before him? From the nations. Very good. So that's, again, a reference to not necessarily, all, it's not Jews that are brought, it's the rest of the world, or maybe there'd be some Jews mixed in, but I'm just going to say it's the nations. The rest of the world is brought before Jesus. When on our Revelation timeline or not our timeline, would that have happened? In after, after the Great Tribulation, after Jesus comes, right here in the Thousand Year Reign. Yes, very good. So right here in the beginning of the Thousand Year Reign, I'm going to stick it under here, you've got the sheep and the goats being separated, being judged. And what's the result of what Jesus says to the sheep? What, are, what is their result? What do they get? They go to the kingdom. They get to enter into the kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. What happens as a result of the goat's judgment? They go to the lake of the fire. Right. They go to the eternal punishment, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But the sheep enter into the kingdom, and that's where that wheat and tares also comes in. The sheep are equated with the wheat, while the goat would be equated to the tares. The tares are bundled and thrown into the fire, which is later, we're told, is the eternal fire. And then we've got the wheat. They get to enter the barn. They get to be brought in as the harvest, a good harvest, right? There's two different harvests. That brings us back to Revelation, where you've got this one like the Son of Man with a sickle, and he's told to reap from the earth, but you've got that other sickle that's told to the other angel, tells another angel with a sickle to reap the vines and throw them into the great wine press of the wrath of God. Okay, so that could be again an analogy, the analogous to the lake of fire, that judgment, all piling all this on top of each other to help us understand it. It also takes from what we've gathered and takes it back into the gospel messages and helps us understand some of those parables. And we're talking about the kingdom of heaven. We're talking about entering into the, his rest. Enter, remember, good and faithful servant, enter into my rest. That would be entering into that rest, that beginning of eternity, sort of. <laughs> Even though there's no beginning to eternity, the beginning of this next phase. So, as you see, he, te he tells a parable, and he says, Behold the fig tree and all the trees. As they, soon as they put forth leaves, you see it, and know for yourself that summer is now near. These are simple things that they would all understand, that even we can understand. Well, I didn't say even we, but we can understand. When you see these things happening, recognize the kingdom of God is near. Events are happening that line up, and they're pointing towards the next phase. And spring is, is before summer. When spring happens, you know summer is near, right? And it says, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away. Did you catch that? Heaven and earth will pass away. In Revelation, are we told about that? Where? When? After the great white throne. And as the great white throne, it says, before the presence of the one sitting on the great white throne, heaven and earth pass away. There's no place found for them. So it's right here that heaven, the old heaven and earth, leave. Or there's no place found for them, however you want to write that. Here it says, heaven and earth will pass away, but not... Let's see, heaven and earth, but my words will not pass away. His words are enduring beyond the things that we are solid to us and we know. Even heaven. Even heaven 
will pass away. The new earth, new, new earth and new heaven. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, yes. New earth, new heaven, and new Jerusalem. Okay. It says, guard your hearts, be on guard, that your hearts be not weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the worries of life. And that day come on you suddenly like a trap. What day are we referring to here? Day of the Lord is a lot of times what it's referred to, right? The day of the Lord is the, this time that's coming that culminates in Jesus' return. That's the day of the Lord. That's the day that should not, if you're talking about a specific day, but it's also talking about a period that's coming, the day of the Lord being a period, but specifically the day of the Lord is when Jesus comes and returns. Okay? And it's saying, don't be found in dissipation and drunkenness and worries of life. It's one of those cautions. Don't get caught up with the things of this world. Remember in Matthew 24, when after he talked about the coming of Son of Man and he was given all of those parables, one of them was the days of Noah. Right? What were they caught up in? Life. They were living life as we are now, living our lives. None of them were righteous, so that's one difference, except for Manoah and his family. They were hearing the gospel. They were hearing the message from Noah all those years. They were visually seeing the ark being built and being told why it was being built, as much as Noah could convey. But they didn't believe it until, Matthew 24 says this, they didn't believe it until when? When the flood flooded them and washed them away. When it was too late. Right. We don't need to be... Be, be, we need to be on guard. We need to be on alert. We need to, Paul tells us, to you know, review your salvation. See if you are in the faith. Not to put fear in you, not to put doubt in you, because I, I shouldn't do that anyway, but to review and to see if you truly are in the faith, because one of the worst things can happen is you are at a pastor call it being inoculated with Christianity. Okay, if you think about taking those little babies in and getting the shots and they scream and cry, or you going and getting a flu shot, what's the goal? Keep you from getting the flu. To keep you from getting the flu or to keep you from getting whatever that disease is. But what do they introduce into your body? They introduce a little bit of that that they don't want you to get. They want your body to fight it. <coughs> so then you're immune to it. So think about that you could be one of those, like I was, for the first 29 years of my life, and there's some good in it. I was glad I was raised by people who went to church. I was glad I was raised in the church. I was glad I was raised with a, a familiarity and a morality and a foundation, but I wasn't saved. I was almost immune to it. God had to overcome that. God had to show me the disease that was in me that was leading me to complete death. He had to show me that. He had to show me the difference. And He saved me from that. He took it completely away. Took the problem completely away. Um, or I would have died. I would have been in the lake of fire someday. We need to examine ourselves. All of us do. All of men. If you know you're saved, don't doubt. I'm not trying to put that in you. But you need to look at your life and say, am I living it? Because if I'm not living it, maybe I'm not. You can't live out what's not in. And that's the beauty of what Romans tells us about the gospel that used to be, the law used to be out here on those tablets of stone. You know, you think about Moses coming off the mountain. Those heavy, heavy tablets of stone. That's where the law was. was external to us. And hopefully we tried to follow it. But what does the New Covenant tell us? God takes our hearts of stone and he replaces them with what? A heart of flesh that can now beat. And then he does what? Writes his law on our hearts. So now it's internal and lived out externally. Okay, I was a really good person. Prior to salvation, you can ask my mom. I know it was in my heart. I wasn't always that great, 
but externally anybody would have said I was a good person. Straight A's, didn't cause my parents problems. I had sisters that did, sorry. Mm -hmm. video. <laughs> um, had great examples in life around me of people who weren't, you know, and I could compare myself to them and be so much better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If nothing else, stay out of trouble. Yeah, I'll pat myself on the back. Sorry, I was responding to Carolyn. Mm -hmm. I'll pat myself on the back. Or at least, um, and we even had a pastor, the same pastor that talked about inoculation, talked about even in Christianity, a lot of times we'll go find that what we call, you know, somebody of shorter stature than us Christian-wise, and we compare ourselves to them. And you're above that. <laughs> I'm the shoulders about that one. <laughs> right? I'm so much that's more spiritual, spiritual than that one. And we have a tendency to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's our point of comparison. Mm -hmm. But who are we to compare ourselves to? Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> right. And the only way I can ever be for a moment like him is, number one, he's in me. And number two, I'm allowing him to work out through me. And I'm completely out of the way. Except for I'm functioning and I'm doing it. I can't do any of that apart from him. So consider all of us. I'm not saying it to you, I'm saying it to all of us. Remember, three fingers pointing back if I'm pointing my finger. Be in the faith, because otherwise. Mm -hmm. And remember at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord. In other words, they're recognizing him. They're using his title correctly. Use, I mean, he has that title. They're using it. And he says to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Depending on your translation, they might say workers of sin, sin or transgression. But it's the idea of iniquity. It's that idea of your particular way of doing things. I always do that bent. Your bent. That's the idea. Of your twistedness, the way you were born. Your particular way that... You may stumble more in a certain way than I do in another way. You know, some people have problem with alcohol. I might not have that problem, but I have my own problem, right? My own bent. But what we can do is we can work, if you notice the end of your lesson, case a concern, and, um, and I wrote it on Facebook, where it said you can work and function and serve God even in the flesh, but the flesh never pleases God. And it tires very easily. That's the working in iniquity. That's working in your power, your way, and in your flesh. And guess what it does? It falls what? Short of the glory of God every time. Therefore, if it what falls short of the glory of God? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The only way I can ever hit the glory of God is again if the Holy Spirit's in me. And I'm letting the Holy Spirit work out of me towards a person or towards whatever. Is in that moment getting out of the way. So important. But we can if it's in us. And the only way we get in it in us is if God has saved us and has put his Holy Spirit, changed my righteousness for his. Did you know that the gospel was so clear and so important in our study of Revelation? And Luke and Matthew very important for us as individuals and it's very important that this message go out in this day. Was there anything else anybody had a question about? Cindy, did I get back to 25 for you, the sheep and the goats? Okay. They would be in after the thousand year reign when the thrones are set up. Remember in, Re in Daniel chapter 12 at the very end, it kind of adds those days. It starts out saying from the time of the abomination of desolation to the end we know is 1260 days. But then it says 1290 days, mm -hmm. right? So that's another 30 days in here. Right. And then it says, blessed is he who attains to the 1345 days. So that's another 1335. That's another 45 days, right? That would be into that thousand year reign. And possibly what would be going on during that time, well, we know what's going to be going on, but possibly why those time phrases are given to us is this judgment's going to be going on where the nations are gathered. 
just hang in there because by the end of Revelation chapter part four, even next part, you're going to know so much more about what's going on around these times. But how important is it to have this first line so solidly set that when we go to these other places, we can start putting it in there? And as Kay does her lesson, you hear a lot of it again. And I hope you don't feel like you're, you know, it's being repeated. But and I don't preview. But as she does that, you're just hearing it again, and maybe seeing it in a different way, written somehow differently, and inserted where it needs to go. And if I say something wrong, which I never hope to, hopefully she'll correct me. <laughs> um, just big things, pivotal points. Seventh trumpet, abomination of desolation happens then. We hear it about it in the Second Thessalonians. We hear about it in Matthew 24. We hear about it in Daniel 9. We hear about it differently in Revelation, <laughs> um, but abomination of, de de of desolation, <coughs> great tribulation comes before the end and immediately following the day, these days, you've got the darkening, you've got the powers of heaven shaken as it says in Luke 21, and Jesus is coming. It's not an end of, in a bad way, it's the end of the age, it's a great <coughs> thing that's coming. Again, can't say it without a smile on my face. That's Revelation 19. That's before Revelation 20. Thousand year reign, Satan bound, great white throne judgment ends at that. It comes at the end of that. At the great white throne judgment, death and Hades are thrown here into the lake of fire. But there's a battle right before that of Gog and Magog where Satan gives that one last chance to deceive who he can. I call it the final purge. That's my word. Final purging. And those are thrown into the lake of fire. Then, what happens after that? New heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem. And the only ones that get that, the only ones that get to go into that, are the ones that did not end up here. Make sure your name is written in the book of life. And if you want to take any people with you, tell them the message. Have them examine and pray that. Right, that's not up to us, it's up to God, yes. But we're just to scatter the seed. And, and God has plowed the field, and God will you'll raise up, and God will allow the plants grow. We're just to scatter the seed. We want them to go with us. We even want our, sorry, we want our enemies to go with us. We don't really want them to stay enemies. We want them to be converted. Right. We'll finish, we'll pray, and we'll have our meal, and have our video from Kay.